Welcome to Ecclesia Baptist. We are so glad that you've joined us this morning on the third Sunday of Advent. This Sunday, we focus on joy, and we begin our Sunday full of joy that you have joined us. So thanks for being here. If we were meeting face to face, we would, the children would lead us forward, hopefully also dressed in purple for Advent. They would lead us to the front and uh, carefully light the candle and often not burning themselves, very often. And then they would place the, the cross in the center of the table in front of me, place my stole around my neck, the stole that was made by our sister church in um, La Vaita, Cuba. You don't get to see the whole thing. Um, but uh, then together, the children and I would turn to you and say, may the peace of Christ be with you. And you would respond, and also with you. Church, let us worship God. Michael. As we come now to the time of our lighting of the Advent wreath, I don't know if all of you got the, uh, I need to put on the website the document I took out to everyone in the Advent kit that explains why the third Sunday of Advent is a pink candle. And so in brief, there's a longer explanation, but in brief, when the Advent season was established by the early church, they decided to, uh, they designed the Advent season somewhat after Lent. 
which is the six weeks preceding or 40 days preceding Easter. And their tradition at the time was on the third week of Lent, they had a mini Easter as every Sunday is a mini Easter, but on the third Sunday of Lent, it was a particularly special Sunday that the bishop would give out pink carnations. That's one of the um, reasons, one of the stories that um, is out there about why we have the pink candle. But it is also the pink candle because um, on the third week of Lent, they would celebrate being you know, halfway to the resurrection. And so that would bring them joy. So all of that, the pink carnations, the Sunday of joy, the third week, all of that is why we have a pink candle on the third week of Advent because it mimics Lent. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it made more sense in the thing I wrote. So I'll try to send that out to everybody. So today at home, I invite you to, to light your first and second candle, but also your pink candle as we watch this video. all please stand for the reading of the gospel. This morning's text is from John chapter 1 verses 6 through 8 and then verses 19 through 28. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given to John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Oops, sorry, I'm stuck. He confessed. He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then are you? Are you Elijah? He asked, I am not. And you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of the, of the one crying out in the wilderness. 
make straight to the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent to the Pharisees, they asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered, I baptize with water, among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I'm not worthy to unite the song of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Anne. So we come to our time of prayers of the people. I wanted to start with some things that we have to be joyful for today. Among them, Cindy, last week we uh, shared a prayer request that Cindy had her physical to see if it, she could um, continue to drive the bus, which is a major part of her income at the school where she works, and she passed the physical. So she is continuing to drive a bus, which is good for her income, possibly not so good for her nerves, but um, we are rejoicing with Cindy on her good news this week. Um, so that she can continue in that role. Other good news, there's a vaccine in the works for the COVID virus. So hallelujah, it sounds like that is a very promising thing. And so that's good news. Oh, it's already being shipped, sorry. Yes, it's already being shipped. So people are gonna be vaccinated and Hopefully our numbers will be coming down and we can get a handle on the pandemic. So that's wonderful news. Oh, here's some good news. Did you hear about the 74 year old man who jerked his King Charles Cavalier puppy out of the mouth of an alligator? That's right. He did the whole thing, saved his five month old puppy. It was in Florida, surprise, surprise, um, from an alligator while still smoking his cigar. Pretty impressive, that's good news, if ever there was good news. Um, there have been breakthroughs in the treatment of Alzheimer's uh, this year, and two people this year have been cured of HIV. Cured, that's amazing. Back in 1980, when we first, I first started hearing about AIDS, it was HIV AIDS, there was no way it could be cured. But now um, two people have been cured. That's wonderful news. Um, there are places in the world where COVID is no more. New Zealand is one of them, and there are others. Um, here's some good news. Hamilton is on Disney Plus. So get your free trial today. Um, also, Crayola introduced new crayons with diverse skin colors so all children could color themselves accurately. Even more good news is that there are newborn babies coming into the world every day. Um, there are celebrity babies being born, uh, Mindy Kaling, Kaling, Chris Pratt, Anderson Cooper, more all had babies this year, but so did our own Carla um, had her baby Cyrus and Bryce Bennett was born to Sarah Weaver and Michael Bennett. My niece, Thea Breckenridge came into the world. And so lots of good news, lots of things for which to be joyful. So let, let us start our prayer time today with gratitude as we go to God in prayer. Loving God, we thank you for giving us joy, for giving us lives that are full of opportunities for delight. We thank you for fresh cut Christmas trees that smell of your own forest. We thank you for bright colors and sparkling lights, for mild weather and for snowfall. We thank you God for giving us the opportunity to come together even though we can't see each other face to face, we thank you for the technology that allows us to meet. And God, our hearts as full as they are of gratitude for our blessings, we confess that there is a dark nagging in our souls, a darkness that pulls us away from joy. As we are reminded 
of the, the brokenness in our world that leads to war, poverty, hunger, disenfranchisement, oppression, and isolation. And as we fill our hearts with gratitude, Lord, let that joy fill over into concern for those whose struggles are so much greater than we could possibly understand. And God, we also lift before you our own struggles, our struggles with work, with the future, with health concerns, with financial worries, with separation from loved ones, with grief, mental illness, loneliness. Oh God, shine the bright light of your love into these dark places in the world and in our lives. God, we ask that you would be with each person whose name is on our heart in this hour. We lift those names to you asking, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Olin Kim Babs. Stan and Kim as they travel uh, coming back home next Sunday night. Both of my parents, Boyce and Jean Earnhardt, who are struggling with Alzheimer's. David Gibbs. Chuck and Barbara Butcher and Emma Jason and her family. The family of Cindy Limonstall, who passed away this week, her husband, Tommy, her daughters, Casey, Tia. Danny Hardy and family. My student, um, Rosie Wilson and we haven't seen in a while. Nancy Frost and all her caregivers. Roberto Patino, so that he will be able to come home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us pray as Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, if you have your bulletin, it says that Trellis is reading the children's story today, and that is not true. I am reading the children's story, but I'm excited to do so, especially since we have Emma with us. So Emma, scoot up close to the screen so you can see the pictures. And we're gonna read a book that we've read before in church. It's been a while, but the name of the book is Those Shoes. And it's written by Mary Beth Bolts, illustrated by Noah Z. Jones. So Mary Beth Bolts wrote the words and Noah Jones drew the pictures. And the book is called Those Shoes. I have dreams about those shoes. Black high top, two white stripes. Grandma, I want them. There's no room for want around here, honey. Only need. 
grandma says, and what you need are new boots for winter. Brandon T comes to school in those shoes. Nate comes to school in those shoes. Antonio and I count how many times Nate goes to the bathroom, seven times in one day, just so he can walk up and down the hall and show off those shoes. Next, Alan Jacoby and Terrence each get a pair. You see that? Everybody but him. It's the only one. Then one day in the middle of kickball, one of my shoes comes apart. Looks like you could, could use a new pair, Jeremy, our guidance counselor says, as he brings out a box of shoes and other stuff for kids who needs things, who need things. He helps me find the only shoes that fit. They're Velcro, like the ones my little cousin Marshall wears. They have an animal on them from a cartoon I don't think any kid ever watched. When I come back to the classroom, Alan Jacoby takes one look at my Mr. Alfrey shoes and laughs. And so do Terrence, Brandon T, and everyone else. The only kid not laughing is Antonio Parker. At home, my grandma says, oh, how nice of Mr. Alfrey. And I think I am not going to quit for my dumb shoes. <laughs> On Sunday, Grandma says, let's check out those shoes you're wanting so much. I got a set aside, might be enough. At the shoe store, Grandma turns those shoes over so she can check the price. When she sees it, she sits down real heavy. Maybe they wrote it down, I say. And grandma just shakes her head. I remember the thrift shop. Kid, I grew his or got two pairs for Christmas or had to give them away or something. We ride the bus to the first thrift shop, no luck. But at the second thrift shop, I see something in the window. Those shoes in perfect shape for $2.50. What? Grandma says, what size are they? I shove my foot into the first shoe, curling my toes to get my heel in. I don't know, but I think they fit. Grandma kneels on the floor. Oh, Jeremy, she says, I can't spend good money on shoes that don't fit. I pull the other shoe on and try to walk around. There, I say, holding my breath and praying that my toes will fall off right then and there so the shoes will fit. I buy them anyway. Even though my shoes don't fall off, I use my own money and limp to the bus stop. At home, a few days later, grandma puts a new pair of snow boots in my closet but doesn't say anything. I'm still shuffling around with my two big feet and my two small shoes. Shoes straight, I say. I check every day, but my shoes do not stretch. I have to wear Mr. Alfrey's to school instead. One day during math, I glance at Antonio's shoes. One of them is taped up and his feet look smaller than mine. After school, I head to the park to think. Antonio is there, the only kid who didn't laugh at my Mr. Alfrey shoes. We shoot baskets, a loose piece of tape on Antonio's sh shoes smacks the concrete every time he jumps. I think I am not, I am not, uh-uh, I'm not going to do it. We leap off the swings. I'm not going to do it. We race from one end of the playground to the other. I am not going to do it, I say. What? Antonio says, breathing hard. Grandma calls me for supper and invites Antonio over too. After supper, he spies my shoes. How come you don't wear them? Antonio asks. 
I shrug. My hands are sweaty and I can feel him wishing those shoes were his. That night I'm awake for a long time thinking about Antonio. When morning comes, I try on my shoes one last time. Before I can change my mind, my shoes are in my coat. Snow is beginning to fall as I run down the street to Antonio's apartment. I put the shoes in front of his door, push the doorbell and run. At school, Antonio is smiling big in his brand new shoes. I feel happy when I look at his face and mad when I look at my Mr. Alfrey shoes. But later, when it's time for recess, something happens. Everywhere, there is snow. Leave your shoes in the hall and change into your boots, the teacher says. New boots, new black boots that no kid has ever worn before. That's what I have in my backpack. Standing in line to go to research sets, Antonio leans forward and says, I smile and give him a nudge. Let's race. You know, Jeremy thought if he could just get those shoes, he would feel so much joy. And then he got them and he didn't feel so joyful after all. But the weirdest thing happened. He felt joy when he gave them away. It didn't make sense, but sometimes we experience joy in ways we never thought we could. And that's what today's text is about. Hope you'll listen. Let's pray. Loving God, for giving us joy in unexpected places, we thank you. Help us always to hear your voice prompting us towards joy. Amen. Thanks, boys and girls. reading is also not right in your bulletin. It's not Isaiah 40. It's Isaiah 61. I, I think I left that from last week. Not sure. Um, and we're going to read actually verses 1 through 4 and then skip down to verses 8 through 11. Hear the word of God. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples, all who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up. So the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hark the herald angels 
shall sing glory to the new Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born as man, no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels. When the people of Sparks first met the folks from the city of Ember, they didn't know what to make of them. Mostly, uh, they felt sorry for them and they wanted to help. Now, spoiler alert. If you haven't read the City of Ember trilogy by Jeannie Duprau, uh, one, why not? And two, I'll try my best not to spoil it. But I can't promise, and there may be some hints to the outcome. The first city of Ember had come from a place very different from anything the people of Sparks could understand. In Ember, the sky was white during the day and black, dark at night. Were found only in greenhouses. There was no grass, lots of concrete. There were no animals, but generations of families had been raised there. Now, Sparks. Sparks was a lot like what we see when we watch shows like Little House on the Prairie. Their sky looked like ours, but they didn't have any concrete. Plenty of animals were around, and plants were how they survived. That's how they ate. So when the people from Ember made their way to the village of Sparks, they were hungry and tired and homeless. So the people of Sparks did what they could to help the poor folks. 
I mean, it, it was the right thing to do. And all the people in, in Sparks felt that was the case. And in the beginning, yes, in the beginning, they were overcome by their own generosity of spirit. They had good news for the poor souls from far off. They would provide for them. They would shelter them. They would bind up their wounds, see to their needs, give them freedom where they had been bound, hope where they had been desperate. They, the people of Sparks, would fix these poor people. And what joy they had in their mission. Only the people from Ember were not so easily fixed. The fixing required much more energy and resources than the people of Sparks had counted on. And frankly, they didn't know how much more they could take. Their joy at sharing quickly morphed into suspicion and distrust. Now, I'm not going to tell you how the whole thing ends. But I will tell you that they don't immediately live happily ever after. But they do learn from each other. And in time, the two groups find that when they work together, honestly working out their difficulties, acknowledging each other's strengths and their own weaknesses, they find they experience a kind of joy that is more than either group had known previously. It took time though, this transformation from frustration to joy. It took time, though along the way they saw glimpses of the joy to come. But the transformation was slow and not always steady for the people of Ember and the people of Sparks. Our text comes to us today from the book of third Isaiah. You know by now, we've read from Isaiah three weeks in a row. And you know by now that Isaiah is really three books, probably, maybe just two in one, depending on who you read. Some people say it's just two, some people say it's three. But it's broken up like this. The first 39 chapters are written by Isaiah, the prophet. But the rest of the book is written by others in his name. Now, this is fine. This wasn't plagiarism like we would understand it today. In fact, it was a way to honor the scholarship of an older, more seasoned um, prophet. And so it wasn't, they weren't lying. They weren't trying to trick us. It was just the way things were done then. So Isaiah the prophet wrote the first 39 books. And he wrote them it, to, for a specific reason to a specific group. And in order for us to get that, we need to do a little history. So it's not my favorite thing, so I love to do this, but come with me back into the history of Israel, all the way back to King Saul. It was under King Saul that the kingdom of Israel was unified. All of these tribes, um, the, the sons of, of Israel, um, folks like Naphtali and Dan and Reuben and Judah and Benjamin and others, all of those tribes were unified under King Saul. And then Saul was followed by David and David was followed by Solomon. In all those years, the kingdom of Israel was unified. It was one. And then Solomon gave his throne to his son Rehoboam, who was not exactly the sharpest crayon in the box. And Rehoboam made some critical errors and thus the kingdom split. We'll get to why it split in a little bit, but the kingdom split into the north, which was 10 tribes, the northern tribes of Israel, 10 tribes. And then the southern area, which was two tribes, the south was called Judah, those two tribes. The north was called Israel. And in Judah was Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem was the temple. So the north and the south are divided now when Isaiah comes on the scene. And what happens is they are being threatened by others outside Israel, other powers that 
rise up. And one of those powers is Assyria. And Assyria comes in and, and conquers the northern tribes and defeat Israel. And Israel becomes the, the top, the northern tribes, the 10 northern tribes become part of Assyria. Judah is safe. And so Isaiah is talking to those people. And he says, you better be careful or what happened to Israel is going to happen to you. Now, remember, the prophets didn't necessarily foretell the future as they did talk about the dangers in current day um, behaviors. And so they were doing what we do when we say to a child, don't touch that. If you touch it, you're going to get burned. So Isaiah said to the people of Judah, don't behave this way. If you keep behaving this way, you're going to get conquered too. Chapters 1 through 39. Guess what happens? They get conquered. Because Babylon rises up, conquers Assyria, and scoops down and picks up Judah as well. And when they do that, they conquer the temple. They conquer Jerusalem. Well, this was devastating to the people, but not even that was not even the end of it because the Babylonian military style of defeat meant that they took the best and the brightest, the educated, the skilled workers, um, those who could offer something to the Babylonian culture. They picked up those um, conquered people and took them back to Babylon. So these are people who were from Israel and Judah who are moved up to Babylon to live there and sort of serve the Babylonian kingdom. We call this time the Babylonian captivity or the Babylonian exile. And we call those people who were taken the exiles. Well, stay with me. Still with me? Everybody, everybody good? Take a breath. So the Babylonian exile occurs, and just like um, Isaiah had warned the people, if you're not careful, you're going to get conquered. Boom, they got conquered. And so the next chapters of Isaiah, verses chapters 40 through 55, deal with these years that were probably written in Isaiah's name uh, and the years that of Babylonian captivity. They were written to give the people hope and they're great chapters of hope and, and um, hang in there and you can do this. Um, beautiful words of encouragement. So remember, United Kingdom split, North is conquered by Assyria, Babylon comes in, it conquers Assyria, picks up Judah, takes them back to Babylon. Well then, along comes Persia and Persia, conquers everybody. And instead of gobbling up the most, the best and the brightest and taking them back, Persia has a different way of leadership, a different military strategy. And that is they make sure that the area that they conquer is ruled by people who are Persian loyalists, right? And so they send the people back. Are you with me? Babylonian captivity is over because Persia sends Cyrus, sends them back to the area of Israel. So they have lived there in that region of Babylon for 70 years. And then they're sent back. Now, this third group of writers writes to those people who were sent back. And that's chapters 56 through 66, third Isaiah, where we are now. So think about those people as they came back. They came back from Babylon, beautiful Babylon, where they, some of them had lived their entire lives, but they'd heard tell of Israel. They'd heard tell of Jerusalem, of the temple, of the glory that was manifested there, the beauty of Jerusalem, the Holy Land. They didn't hear the stories of devastation and pillaging or, or looting that happened in the years when they were gone. So when they came back, 
to this area they had dreamed about. Coming back, they knew, ah, now we can feel joy. We'll go back home and we will have such joy. And they go back home and it's not what they thought. Instead of a thriving kingdom that serves Yahweh, that has a temple to God's glory, they find the city in ruins. And they also find some people who have been left behind. Now those people, when they see the people coming back from Persia, at first, glad to see them. We got some help to do this work we need to do. At first, I bet they were happy to share the resources with them. But my guess is that their joy at receiving these exiles who proclaimed that they were the best and the brightest, they were the ones chosen to be taken away. My guess is that that compassion the locals felt for these foreign natives began to wane. This was hard and confusing and disheartening. And so this third section of Isaiah speaks to those people. Listen to the words that Isaiah offers them. God has sent me, me being this unnamed prophet, to bring good news to the oppressed to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. Feel the energy among those two diverse groups of people trying to assimilate their lives. I'm here to, to bring comfort to all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes the oil of gladness instead of mourning, they will be called oaks of righteousness. That was good news. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. So remember the history, remember the split of the kingdom. Do you know why they split? They split because Rehoboam, not the sharpest crayon in the box, decided that in order to finish the work his father Solomon had started on the, on the temple, he needed to enslave the people from up north to do the work. Now, the reason he had to go up north to do the work is because they had trees. There, if you've been to Jerusalem, you know this. There are no trees in Jerusalem. They mean, there's some little scrub bushes that are trying their best, but they ain't never going to be no tree in Jerusalem. So, in order to get trees to build with, you have to go up north to Galilee, where there are plenty of trees. And so Rehoboam conscripted, enslaved people from up north to bring down these cedars and oaks to build the temple. But here Isaiah says, you will be called oaks of righteousness. You will be the planting of the Lord. You will be the ones to display his glory, not the temple. Now, knowing that history, know how the people, all of them just kind of stood up a little taller, said, well, we're trees. We're, going, we're the ones God's going to build the temple on. We're the ones. We're the ones where God's going to display his glory. So, as they thought about that, as they began to let that word sink in, that the joy of God, the glory of God would be revealed in them, the writer goes on and says this, they shall build up the ancient ruins. What ruins? The, the ones that are all around them. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities of Jerusalem and Capernaum and Galilee. The devastation of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery, looting, pillaging, and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their rep recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Not something temporary. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the people. 
and all who see them will acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. Oh boy, what sweet music to their ears this must have been. What joy this must have brought them as they considered God will bring justice by using me. I'll be the tree. I'll be the oak of righteousness. Oh, the joy of having my homeland come back to its own self because of me. And here's where the voice of scripture changes. And we hear these words, I will, will, will greatly rejoice in the Lord. See, a shift. Now we're hearing from the people. My whole being shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garment of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, as a bride decks herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, its trees, and a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Oh, the joy of it. But oh, the job of it. I bet you, just like the people of Sparks, the descendants who returned to Israel grew weary of the work of it, the effort of making things right. I bet they forgot that the spirit was there to guide them. And I bet they stopped asking for guidance. I bet they forged ahead at times with their own plans rather than following the wisdom of the spirit. I bet they got ahead of themselves a time or two and did some not so smart things. Maybe they took a shortcut they were sure would move things along only to find there were unforeseen difficulties. Maybe they tried a newfangled innovation that had not been properly tested. Maybe they got overconfident in their own strengths. Maybe they responded too quickly. Maybe they posted something on social media out of anger that they should have kept to themselves. I don't know, but I bet you that that initial joy began to transform into something a little less joyful. But the thing is, I suspect this as well. In the end, I think like the people of Sparks, they got a joy that was not what they expected. They got the time-tested joy that comes slow through working through hard times. I, I suspect they really wanted fast, exhilarating joy, but what they got was deliberate and reliable joy. I suspect that what they wanted was the joy of immediate satisfaction. And what they got was the satisfaction of intentional joy. I imagine they envisioned a joy of triumph, triumphant victory. And what they got was a joy that took time and attention, but that sustained them through trials and failures. Like the people of Israel, the people of Sparks, we too are invited to expect joy. But we should be warned that joy often comes in unexpected packages, in unfamiliar places. Like the joy that came to a stable in Bethlehem as an innocent baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. Let us pray. Oh God, for the gift of joy, we give you thanks for the opportunity to walk through difficulty to the joy at the other end. We thank you, even as we pray that you will give us the strength to walk through it. Help us to turn our eyes to you, expecting joy to come from you, not from our own efforts. Remind us that you will always provide 
remind us that it is through us that your glory will be proclaimed to the world. It is in the name of your son, Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, that we pray. Amen. You have heard the word of God read. You've heard it sung. You've heard it proclaimed. Now it's up to you to respond in whatever way you feel so led as we sing this final hymn, which is Angels We Have Heard on High, and it's probably at the very beginning of your hymn book. Sorry, I did not give you those numbers at, at the start. Angels We Have Heard on High. Let us sing. Today we sang, Hark, or the, we heard Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and then we sang Angels We Have Heard on High. Um, so we got both my dad's Christmas song, Herald, and my mother's, whose first name is Gloria. So hope you enjoyed that. And church, go forth in joy, knowing that you are loved, and there is nothing you can do about it. Have a great week, and we will see you. Next week on the fourth Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of love, I invite you to take a picture this week of what love means to you, hopefully with your face in there somewhere um, and a sign that says what, you, um, what love means to you. And this one's an easy one, folks. This is like a soft pitch because got lots of things we love. So I hope you'll send me a picture this week of you with something you love and or someone you love. And I will put that in the slideshow for next week. Have a great week. And I will see you next Sunday, the Sunday of love.